Do you have a favorite wine varietal? Well, like many folks, they start their wine journey with this varietal that we're going to be talking about on today's episode. It has a long history and is well known for its blending qualities. Also, what's the average wine enthusiast drinking now? All that and so much more on this episode of The Average Wine Enthusiast. Hi there, everybody. My name's Mike LaPlante, and I'm the Average Wine Enthusiast. I thought on this episode, I would talk about one of the most popular grape varietals out there. And of course, I'm talking about Merlot because I already did the Cabernet Sauvignon show. <laughs> so yes, we're talking about Merlot, one of the grapes out there that has most of the vines in the ground. Uh, this is, of course, worldwide. Um, and we'll get into why it's so popular in a little bit. But first, I thought I would go through a little bit of history of Merlot. Um, it beca became known as a wine grape late in the 1700s. However, uh, the people who do this kind of testing, usually over at uh, U of C in Davis in California there, uh, they uh, track down the DNA of these grapes and they can, it's, it's like the bark of a tree, not the bark of a tree, but the trunk of a tree. You can tell how long a, a grape has been around. And apparently Merlot has been around since about the first century. So it's, it's almost 2000, well, it is 2000 years old, right? So this is a grape that's been around a long time. However, it was just began to be known as a grape of notoriety, let's say, around uh, the mid 1700s. It was, that's where we have the first record of a grape that we know as Merlot. Back then, they called the grape uh, Merlot. So it was named after a bird, a little black bird, that apparently liked to eat the seeds of the Merlot grape. Uh, of course, you know, you would think, well, why wouldn't the birds be eating the actual grape itself? But uh, I'm sure that happened as well back then. Grapes grew in all different kinds of locations, uh, typically on the edge of water, like, you know, when they're wild, and they grew in a bush, so you didn't have the, you know, the nice rows of, of grape vines uh, that they have now today in the uh, modern wine industry. So yeah, this wine is basically named after a, a bird. That is one of the, uh, that's part of the wine lore that I love. You know, you, there's all kinds of different um, stories that come about that are handed down and uh, you know there's a little bit of truth here a little bit of not so much truth over here and it all melds together uh, and but then there's folks out there who are really trying to get down to the the uh, the science of of the timing of everything but it's nice to have that human element in there which of course humans are extremely imperfect and uh, that is added to the the lore of a lot of grapes out there and uh, their place in uh, in the world of wine, I guess you'd say. So um, supposedly, uh, in the 1800s, it was regularly planted in Madoc, which is a very famous um, region within Bordeaux. I guess you'd call it a subregion. And uh, it was widely planted there, and it was used. M in large part as a, a blending grape for other grapes that they were growing there. And of course, this is uh, on the left bank, the Rive Gauche of the Jaronde River, or it could be just Jaronde. Uh, I'm not positive because I'm not French. Um, so also, uh, it also started being grown in the uh, 1800s uh, in other areas of the world, um, most notably in Italy. Uh, where they called it Bordeaux, B-O-R-O, -O, no, B-O-R-D-O. So I'm not sure if that's where uh, the region got its name or the grape got its name from the region itself. So skip ahead to the 20th century and Merlot was chugging along, doing fine. And then in the 70s in Bordeaux, the... Uh, Merlot had an issue with rot, so they would grow it and the, the vines and the grapes would 
wouldn't be any good anymore to the point where the government which is in control of the the growing of grapes because obviously it's so ingrained in the french culture they said no more planting of merlot grapes so you have this rot you're taking your vines out we don't want you planting any more merlot in those spots so they either left it fallow or they grew another grape in that spot uh, jump across the ocean and you have a great popularity of um, Merlot. Merlot just started uh, taking off uh, a lot of the vines that were in the, uh, on the west coast of the United States, especially. Uh, they started planting Merlot who knows when. And uh, it was started becoming very popular. Uh, also, the popularity of Merlot was attributed to a, a study that was done that was then televised a story was done about it on 60 minutes if uh, you're of the generation that knows what 60 minutes is uh, they did a story on the benefits of drinking red wine uh, and since then that uh, that study has been much maligned and torn down and a lot of people said it was just a bunch of alcoholic doctors who wanted to make sure that uh, no that wasn't it at all but uh, the validity of how much uh, red wine is good for you is, you know, that's a, that's a story that's up in the air because you hear these people who are like, you know, in their hundreds and they say, well, how'd you, what's your secret to lasting so long? And they say, I drank one glass of red wine a day. Uh, is that true? Who knows? I'm not sure, but I'm sure there's some science in there that can say that's a lot of the things that uh, red wine does for you is good. Uh, just like everything, everything in moderation. And then, too much Merlot. So Merlot is a grape that uh, is easy to grow when it's not suffering from rot. Um, but it, 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 in generally, generally speaking, it is an easy grape to grow. It grows in large uh, swaths of lines of latitude. Can grow pretty far north. Can grow pretty far south. And uh, it's. It's a popular grape. Why? Because it tastes good, for one thing. We'll get into the flavor profile of Merlot in a little bit. Um, but for the most part, Merlot was overgrown in the 70s, 80s, and the 90s. So lots of people were growing Merlot because it was easy to grow. Yields could be really high, and um, winemakers could make lots of money. And a lot of wine companies out there got their start by starting to grow and sell uh, Merlot and uh, of course there's there's an issue with that always if you have too much of something there's going to be a large portion of the wine that's out there is going to be crap so uh, just to relay a, a personal story something that kind of sticks in my head in my wine journey is uh I was drinking Merlot on a pretty regular basis. I would buy the, uh, in the 1990s, I was buying Jackson Triggs, which is a, uh, a Canadian large corporation now. But back then, they probably weren't as big, um, but they were out of the Niagara region. I'm not sure if they had, they were growing grapes in British Columbia or not. But anyway, they uh, were um, making the wine that I was drinking, and it was Merlot. And then I remember going out, to visit my brother in British Columbia. And I remember that I, I could distinguish the fact that the wines I was drinking out there were better than the, the wine I was drinking here in, Can in uh, Ontario. So uh, I, w I w enjoyed a lot of that wine, but I remember one very specific bottle of wine that I bought. It was a Sumac Ridge Merlot. And uh, I remember bringing it with me. I took off from my brother's house and I brought it with me along with a few other bottles to um, Whistler went uh, did some skiing in Whistler and I remember opening up this bottle and thinking to myself that wow this is just it was too much something back then I didn't have uh, you know the palate or the knowledge to know exactly what it was that uh, I was experiencing but uh, now that I think about think back on it I think it probably was too alcoholic with the alcohol by volume was probably a little too high uh, maybe some poor uh, winemaking uh, techniques were used. Crappy grapes might have been a bad year. I have no idea what the the situation was, but that really that flicked a switch in my head, saying, you know, I thought that all BC wines were 
were much better than the wine in Ontario, but this one Merlot that I had isn't as good as the one that I had that I drink on a regular basis in Ontario. So after that, I realized that I drank other Merlots and other wines that I, I realized uh, were suffering from poor quality. And uh, many of them, of course, were Merlots because I was buying Merlot. And that's when I realized that, you know, there can be too much of a good thing because if there's too much of a good thing, much of that good thing isn't very good at all. So th that's what happened with Merlot. Then the movie Sideways came out with uh, Paul Giamatti, who some people think I look like. Um, and uh, I forget the other guy. But anyway, he pretty much dissed Merlot. They were, I think they were waiting outside of a... You got it. And if they want to drink Merlot, we're drinking Merlot. No, if anybody orders Merlot, I'm leaving. I am not drinking any fucking Merlot! Okay, okay. <laughs> Relax, Miles. <laughs> and that was a line that really uh, resonated with a lot of people. Because I'm sure, it, it, like me, they, people were thinking, Wow, what's, what's wrong with Merlot? You know, I like Merlot. <laughs> and, of course, uh, sales supposedly suffered slightly for Merlot uh, after that movie uh, aired. But it, for the most part, who, who's watching the movie sideways except the one, people who are digging wine and maybe people who are digging Paul Giamatti. And, of course, Paul Giamatti's character was heavily uh, talking up Pinot Noir. So, of course, from what I understand, the sales of Pinot Noir went up far more than the sales of Merlot went down. But, uh, you know, it's all relative, I guess, because there's so much Merlot being bought at the time. It, was, it would be hard to make a dent in that, whereas maybe Pinot Noirs were uh, less accessible as they are now, as, as comes to think of it. Um, so maybe that's why Pinot's uh, percentage of sales went up. So... Um, uh, that was a, another turning point in my wine drink journey was the, the movie Sideways thinking, wow, Merlot, that's, you know, that's my wine. <laughs> Maybe I should be trying other wines. What about Pinot Noir? Uh, so uh, it's funny how popular culture can affect uh, entire industries out there. So yeah, Merlot uh, definitely had its ups and downs. You can definitely get uh, bad ones, but I think bad Merlots nowadays are much less common today because winemakers have uh, adjusted and are, are innovative now. And instead of planting, uh, you know, swaths of, large swaths of Merlot, they're picking up other varietals that they think will sell as good or maybe even better than their Merlot. A lot of um, a lot of Merlot is used for blending, that's for sure. And uh, we'll get into that right now as far as what what is it, what is it about Merlot that people like. So what is it about Merlot that uh, we can attribute its popularity with? Well, it's it's somewhat unassuming in so much that uh, its tannins are rounder. You don't, they don't uh, tend to grip you and bite your palate. Uh, it's a softer type of grape as well. Then there's, of course, the flavor profile. You get the, the yummy cherries, the plum, the chocolate notes, uh, the vanilla, uh, and sometimes you get uh, like dried herbs, like uh, dried oregano or thyme you can find in there as well. So it's a yummy wine for sure. And uh, it also blends well with other wines, uh, especially Cabernet Franc, maybe Cabernet Sauvignon. You see a lot of those blends out there as well because the Merlot can, it's like an envelope for the other varieties that are, are blended with it. It's kind of like it holds everything together and definitely doesn't, it, it's not the, the star of the show. It does all the heavy lifting more or less in terms of keeping the wine together and uh, presenting, you know, the the other grape varieties in a uh, in a way that is pleasant, and um, and it does a good job at that as well. So uh, sure enough, there's a lot of single varietal Merlots being sold out there, but uh, a lot of the Merlot that is made into wine is for blending. Uh, speaking of a single varietal Merlot. 
Uh, I have a uh, 2019 organic Merlot out of Summerhill, which uh, I have have uh, a few bottles of this, and it's, it is a yummy wine, organic wine out of British Columbia. Thing to behold, that's for sure. I love this stuff. And, of course, you, uh, yeah, you have the, the plum and the cherry on your nose. A little bit of uh, dried herb on there as well. Let's give it a taste. Yeah, see the, the acidity is there. This is a very young wine and that'll probably settle down a little bit as well. But the tannins just are, they're present and they let themselves be known, but it, they're not too grippy and they really let the flavors of the wine come through. Nice long finish on this as well. It's doing a little dance in the back of my palate right now. Um, so uh, if I would suggest you head over to Summerhill and pick up a bottle of organic Merlot if you, uh, if you get the opportunity. They, uh, they will ship wine all across the country. And uh, it's a pretty decent value too for the, the, the quality of the wine that they make over there. Uh, Merlot is just one of their staples that they have over there. And they do a, a fantastic job of making it. So I guess that's going to do it for uh, this section of the show, the Merlot section. I uh, hope you learned a thing or two and you kind of understand where Merlot sits in the, uh, I wouldn't call it a hierarchy, but in the, in the big scheme of things, in the puzzle of wine where Merlot sits, it's it, obviously they have to grow a bunch of it because they blend with it. They sing, sell lots of single varietal of it and uh, most of it nowadays is very good. Okay, to finish off the show, I just wanted to uh, turn you folks on to uh, a couple of the latest rosés that I've been drinking. Um, there's the, the rosé out of Provence. It's, it's my favorite. Um, I think I've said it a million times on the show. But uh, these are two that I had bought recently that I really dug, and I bought a couple more bottles. Um, and, of course, they're out of Provence as well. Uh, this one here is called Meadow, and it's, uh, like I said, it's from the Provence area, but it's from a different subregion. It's from the Coteau, I'm not even sure how you pronounce, Coteau Verrois en Provence. Uh, so that's its own sub-appellation there in Provence. And then this other one that I like a lot is the um, La Trois Cypress, and it's uh, from the Duloc uh, brand of wines out there and this is from the Côte de Provence and uh, they are both delicious rosés that I can highly recommend if you're into the rosé scene which you should be because rosé is uh, a unique wine unto itself and uh, yeah it's got a lot going for it and these two here are under 20 bucks and uh, a good uh, bang for your buck, a really good way to uh, either start uh, your wine drinking night or they go great with food as well. That's another thing that I really like about rosé. Lots of food goes with rosé. You'd be surprised. Obviously not the thick, heavy, fatty, smoky stuff, but other types of foods, simple foods, go with rosé. Give it a try. Well, I guess that's going to do it for this episode of the show. I'd like to thank you for watching. And I'd also like to ask you if you know people who are into wine just as much as you are and who watch YouTube videos about wine, turn them on to the average wine enthusiast. I would really appreciate it. I'd also like to thank the Big Organ Trio for letting me use their music in the show. Until next time, folks, my name is Mike LaPlante, and I'm the average wine enthusiast. Salud!